Way back in 2009, we cured colorblindness. In monkeys. Human trials seemed as one step away when everything came to a grinding halt. Thirteen years after these two red-green colorblind squirrel monkeys were gifted a normal color vision, there are still no public plans to repeat this in humans or even in animals. What? Why are we still waiting? Today on Chromophobe, we'll take a look at the current outlook for a cure for red-green color blindness centered on the only viable options on the table, gene therapy. I'm actually going to make this video in two parts. In the first part, this video, I'll go over the fundamentals and history of gene therapy for color blindness. In part two, I'll take a look at some brand new results that just came out last week, which may be the first human cured of their color blindness. <coughs> Kinda. Color blindness may not be the most debilitating condition, but there is still strong demand for a cure. Nine months ago, I made a video looking at 12 fake pseudoscience cures for color blindness from homeopathy to hypnosis. The pervasiveness of these fake treatments shows that there is a demand for a cure and also a real lack of a supply. Daniel Fluch, owner of the Coal Blinder website, performed a poll of 280 colorblind individuals in 2010 showing that the cost an average colorblind person would be willing to pay for a cure was at least $3,300. Apply that to the 300 million or so colorblind people in the world and you've got yourself a trillion dollars waiting to be spent on a cure. That is high demand. So what kind of options do we have for curing colorblindness? The vast majority of cases of colorblindness are purely genetic. They are caused by an inherited mutated gene. To cure it, you need to replace the bad genes with normal genes. The shotgun approach would be a retinal or just a full eye transplant. Take an eye from someone with normal color vision and just pop it in your eye socket. In the 2002 movie Minority Report, they made Tom Cruise's full eye transplant look trivially easy. But for a sci-fi film where there are literally mutants predicting the future, this afternoon eye transplant was perhaps the most far-fetched part of it. In the real world, eye transplants are largely considered a pipe dream because of the complexity and fragility of the optic nerve. They're simply not going to happen anytime soon. So let's instead take a look at, I don't know, the, the, the sniper rifle approach. This method involves leaving your eye where it belongs, but just gently injecting a functional gene in the cells where it's needed, like a casual suggestion to your retina, like, hey, how about you try this gene out? See if you like it, no big deal, no commitment. We'll leave it up to you. We trust you, retina. If done right, the cell will start using the new gene, thereby curing your color blindness. This is gene therapy. Gene therapy isn't only for the eyes, though. It can be used to treat any genetic disorder. The first successful human application of gene therapy was way back in 1990, but it took another 25 years until the first niche application of gene therapy was finally approved by the FDA. Because medicine be hard. To date, there are less than a dozen FDA approved therapies, but human trials are ongoing in everything from cancer to Alzheimer's. The core principle of gene therapy revolves around a viral vector, the tool to get the new genes into the target cells. For example, a doctor might start with a virus like HIV, replace the angry DNA with friendly DNA, poke a bunch of holes into your eyeball, and inject the virus behind your retina. Sounds terrible, which is why we give it a friendly name like gene therapy. Of course, the whole deal with viruses is that they replicate by sneaking their DNA into your cells, which your cells then happily produce for them, leading to more viruses. The viruses are perfectly evolved for this task, but we can re-engineer them to instead inject pretty much any DNA that we want. The new DNA then ideally gets incorporated permanently into the cell's genomes and in most cases functionally replaces the old gene. After gene therapy, the color vision should not be that different to someone with normal color vision. By the way, those numbers in the corner are footnotes for tidbits that I had to cut for time, but you can still read them on my website, link in the description. So why is gene therapy to cure color blindness so difficult? Well, the first answer is that everything is hard once you get the brain involved. Color blindness is often compared to hemophilia because genetically they work in very much the same way. It's not surprising then that there are multiple gene therapies for different types of hemophilia, which will each imminently be receiving FDA approval. 
these therapies beat the colorblindness gene therapies to market, not only because injections into your liver are way less invasive than your eyeball, and not only because hemophilia, I mean, it sucks, but also because once the genes are in the liver, it's almost as if they were never missing. As soon as the new gene gets expressed to make the new protein, specifically clotting factors in the case of hemophilia, your body is ready to clot. Next time you say, stick your fingers somewhere they don't belong, it's simply sayonara hemophilia. Gene therapy for vision though is different because not everything else necessary for vision is just waiting in standby for that one missing functional gene, that missing link in the chain to be made available. That's because a critical part of the visual transduction pathway, the pathway that transduces the visual signal, uh, is obviously your brain. And this leads to the plasticity problem, which is a term I just made up, but you never would have guessed that, right? It's, it's, a great, it's a great name. Neuroplasticity is the brain's way of reorganizing itself to optimize its interpretation of the inputs it receives. Let's consider your visual cortex, which is not a deterministic hardwired circuit that will behave the same way to the same inputs over and over again. Rather, it will continuously reconfigure its circuitry depending on the signals it gets from your retinas. If someone is born totally blind, the visual cortex doesn't just hang around hoping to be useful one day, it adapts to perform non-visual tasks, namely auditory and language-based tasks. But say you find a switch that can eliminate the problem that caused the blindness in the first place, something like, I don't know, um, gene therapy. Would it literally be like turning a light switch on? Definitely not. The visual cortex would not be able to suddenly cope with the brand new visual signals that it's never seen before. It needs a considerable amount of time to readjust to the new inputs. The inputs into your brain are actually neatly organized into three opponent channels one that carries the black and white image, and the other two that add the color. Someone with monochromacy has a brain accustomed to interpreting that one black and white channel, but has never had to interpret signals from the other two channels, those, those that carry the color. Flip the switch that brings those two color channels online, and the brain will need a considerable amount of time to be able to interpret them into a meaningful, colorful image. You may have heard that babies are born colorblind. It was really popular a few years ago to see science-based black and white baby toys and books that really lean hard into this notion that somehow they'll be more visible to infants. While these toys are kind of bullshit, it's not untrue that babies are colorblind. It's, it's, it's actually a fascinating topic that uh, I've plotted out for a future video, but in, in short, it takes babies about six months for the visual cortex to organize enough to take advantage of all of the visual info. This includes interpretation of color, which undergoes major improvements around the three to four month mark. Think of it this way. When a baby is born, they are essentially cured of blindness because I mean, not like he was using his eyes in the womb. The six months it takes them to adapt to sight is actually super fast because babies have super neuroplasticity. However, the older you get, the less plastic your brain becomes. If you flip that switch to cure a 75 year old that has been blind their whole life, it's likely that their brain will never be able to understand the new visual signals because their visual cortex has been largely set in stone, completing other tasks. Actually, expose their newly rehabilitated eyes to a visual feast like fireworks and those neural signals may do nothing in the brain but give grandpa a migraine. This is why gene therapy for colorblindness is best performed young while the brain is still as plastic as possible. We simply don't know how plastic a brain has to be in order to adapt to the new color signals. And this was the main unknown we had to answer when we started testing gene therapy on animals. In 2009, a team out of the Knights Lab at the University of Washington was able to cure colorblindness in a pair of squirrel monkeys, Sam and Dalton. Ooh, named after me. What an honor, but who the hell is Sam? Uh, I've got no idea. Like most mammals, male squirrel monkeys are dichromats and therefore considered colorblind, at least relative to your typical humans. They have the equivalent of S opsins and M opsins, so this study delivered a human L opsin to complete that trifecta in the form of 27 trillion viral vectors injected subretinally. After the injections, the monkey's color vision was tested daily using a pretty standard test for colorblindness. You may recognize it as a Ishihara test, but instead of showing digits, the monkeys would just have to touch the recolored region which traveled randomly around the screen for which it would get rewarded with some sugar. 
After daily testing for over four months, the monkeys showed no significant improvement, which was surely disheartening for the researchers. They used electroretinography to essentially see that there were trichromatic signals coming out of the retina, but they didn't seem to be getting picked up by the brain. How long would they have to wait for this neuroplasticity to kick in, or would it ever? Well, after 20 weeks, the test results did this. There was a sudden and dramatic improvement to the monkey's red-green color vision, showing plainly that they had indeed developed trichromatic vision. This is, interestingly, about the same amount of time that it takes human babies to start seeing in color. Even two years after the procedure, the monkeys had retained their improved color vision, showing us that the cure was permanent. Huge success! Dozens of PopSci articles were written about this achievement. The extrapolation to humans felt imminent, but 13 years later, what do we have to show for it? There has been zero movement on starting clinical trials to cure my color blindness. Meanwhile, the only progress in animal tests seems to be quite regressive, with just a pair of studies out of China that succeeded in making monochromatic rats dichromatic again? Cool. So, so I had to ask, um, what in the hell are we waiting for? Well, the problem with extrapolating this to humans is that subretinal injections, how you get the virus into the cone cells, are a risky business. That's because the subretinal injections are quite invasive, traditionally involving a number of incisions around and through your eye to get the needle to where it has to go, which, of course, carries risks of complications and, in the worst case, losing an eyeball. They're also largely unproven, underdeveloped procedures, which you can tell by the fact that they don't even have their own Wikipedia article. I, for one, would definitely not risk even a 1% chance of going blind, even if curing my CBD was a certainty. The benefit is simply not great enough to overcome such a significant risk, and it's this skewed risk-reward balance that seems to be the sticking point preventing these trials from continuing. This leaves us with two possibilities going forward. Number one, we find a less invasive way to get the viral vectors into the cone cells. Or number two, we make subretinal injections less risky. Let's look at the first option. In 2015, the same Knight's lab uh, entered into a partnership with Avalanche Biotech that promised to decrease the risk of gene therapy by replacing the subretinal injections with less invasive intravitreal injections. Simple shots that you could, in theory, get from your family doctor. The trade-off, though, is that they don't deliver the viral vector to where your cone cells are, so have been a lot less effective in related clinical trials. The biotech company named these technologies AVA322 for protans and AVA323 for dutans and projected starting clinical trials by the end of 2016. To commemorate their new partnership with the Knight's Lab, Avalanche even released a new website, colorvisionawareness.com, so us colorblind folk could track the progress of and soon register for those clinical trials. Don't bother registering now though, because that site no longer exists. Resorting, as I do, to archive.org, I found that the website lasted only for about a year and a half before being replaced by, and I kid you not, one man's blog reviewing Tokyo prostitutes. I have so many questions. Are they relevant to the story? Not at all. I guess I'll find out later. Come mid-2016, not only was the website gone, but there was no mention anywhere on the internet of the partnership or the clinical trials. Now, I am accustomed to performing 99% of my research on the internet, uh, but I put on my big boy pants and got in contact with Dr. J. Knight at the Knight's Lab to get the rest of the story. Um, through email, though, because... I'm still a millennial. <laughs> Apparently, soon after the partnership went public, Avalanche's flagship gene therapy for macular degeneration suffered some disappointing clinical results. Since this was supposed to be foundational to the red-green gene therapy, the poor results, along with ensuing turmoil in the company's executive, eventually led to the cancellation of their partnership. And like any good divorce, there is never an easy way to divide who owns what, and in this case, the IP issues turned a bit ugly and really put a damper on any research going forward. However, Dr. Knights also assured me that there is still some slow, slow progress going on behind closed doors. 
Last year, they even treated yet another monkey and now have some fresh preliminary results. But still, it feels like we are no closer to a cure than we were almost 13 years ago. Where there has been significant progress is on the second pathway, that is, refining the subretinal injections and proving their safety through repeated application and gene therapy for achromatopsia. Now, let me just recap what that is. While the red-green colorblind have one of their three cone cells affected, those with achromatopsia have all of their cone cells affected. Unlike red-green colorblindness, their option genes are typically normal, but one of the genes for necessary proteins downstream the phototransduction pathway is mutated, and the cone cells are unable to trigger the optic nerve. As a result, achromats are colorblind, but colorblindness is actually the least of their concerns compared to the co-occurring symptoms of uh, day blindness, which makes it literally painful to see during the day, and poor visual acuity that cannot be corrected with glasses. The disability of achromatopsia is an order of magnitude worse than red-green colorblindness, so even a partial cure is a much bigger benefit to the individual. That risk-reward balance therefore tips in favor of, yes, please, slice my eyeballs open. While subretinal injections are risky now, many of the challenges can be overcome, at least hypothetically, with continuous development, which naturally improves the more achromats that opt to go under the needle. But I don't want to get too out of hand. I mean, achromatopsy gene therapy is not just a stepping stone towards my cure. It's probably way more important than any cure that I've got coming, so uh, let's take a closer look at them. Starting in 2007, around the same time as the squirrel monkeys, Studies for gene therapy to cure achromatopsia have gained a much steadier momentum. After animal trials in mice, dogs, and sheep, human clinical trials for gene therapy in achromats started in 2020, and the first positive results just came out a few weeks ago. As in, we may have seen the first instance of colorblindness being cured in humans. I definitely want to get a lot deeper into those results, which are super fascinating. Uh, so I'll be covering that in part two of this video, which will follow in just a couple weeks. Um, if it's ready by the time you're watching this, there should be a card in this corner and also a thumbnail link uh, in the end card. This is Chromophobe.